Welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today I will be speaking about one particular topic, and that is how to use theory, literary theory, to understand the world around us. Someone had posed this query to me, and also in my classes, I always encourage my students to think beyond the classroom and relate literary theory to the real life issues. And I'll be doing this using the current political situation in the United States, especially President Trump's uh, presidency or rule or whatever you want to call it. Now, please bear in mind that there is no script in front of me. I'm doing this just using the little that I have in my head and trying to deliver an analysis of the current political situation. Now, I'll analyze the Trump presidency and its impact on the United States and its reception and image in the world. And I will do that using a theoretical concept called symbolic capital. Okay. Now, this particular concept comes from Pierre Bourdieu, and I'll post a link to his book in the description. And in discussing the symbolic capital, what Bourdieu suggests is that in opposition to materialistic capital, the capitalism that we know of societies, there is also symbolic capital that also decides how people view a certain situation. And in some cases, the symbolic capital actually forces you or encourages you to perform actions that make no material sense, that make no capitalistic sense. And his example in his studies of the tribal cultures, he gives the example of a tribal elder who had bought the most expensive pair of oxen. And if you sat down and rationally calculated the value of that oxen against the service that they would have provided to that farmer, that landowner, they would have never become profitable. But the reason this tribal elder does that is not for the labor that he can extract from the pair of oxen, but for the symbolic recognition that he has the capacity to purchase the most expensive pair of oxen, which then increases his symbolic capital in the community because of which he is recognized, he is respected. Now, Bourdieu also explains to us that, the, the, that the, at the root of symbolic capital is capital itself. You have to have wealth to have power, right? and to be recognized. But in the public domain, that economism of it is erased, right? And people treat you with respect as if they respect you for who they are. So the sheer economism of it, the material capitalistic aspect of it, remains hidden. And that is what Bourdieu suggests is, is a misrecognition and for symbolic capital to be operative in a society, that misrecognition, reading capital as not capital, is essential. Now, let's see how we can plot this against the current situation in the United States. Now, everyone in the world has always known that the United States has the largest economy in the world. It has the most powerful military force in the world that it has the coercive power to break the wills of nations and force them to do things that they want to do. And maybe in history, the United States has done that too. But that brute force, that power, global power, was always masked, right, with the symbolics of what constitutes United States. So while United States had this power, Right? While it had this power of economy and military, it always offered itself as a voice for freedom, right? individualism, uh, maybe generosity, uh, maybe a place where people can have their rights, a nation that respects laws, international and local. 
So those symbolics of being a deliberative, democratic, rational power were the ones that people read in terms of United States symbolic capital. No U.S. president before Mr. Trump ever went out in the world and said, you want our troops to help you? Pay us $2 billion, right? Or you've been buying from us. We want you to buy more of our stuff. You haven't paid your bills. All these things were done previously, but they were done through back channels and not through Twitter and the front end because the office of the president, besides running the country with Congress and the judiciary, also managed the symbolic image of United States and the actions of the president invested in the symbolic capital, created it, sustained it. Now, when that misrecognition has been unmasked and what is being offered to the world openly in clear, simple words is that whatever you do with us or we do for you is transactional. You will pay us money for these, these services. If you cannot pay us money, we will not give you that kind of importance. If you are a nation which is weak, which is poor, you don't merit much in our estimation. All of these messages are very clearly being sent through statements, through tweets, right, through legislations. So while this makes the presidency come across as strong, right, in domestic politics, in the global world, it is increasingly destroying the symbolic capital that United States has and replacing it with the brute power of United States, power that exists, that is palpable, right, but which was never really foregrounded unless in a confrontational situation, after all, shock and awe and all that else was also done by United States, right? But mostly in global diplomacy, it was the symbolic capital that was mobilized, right? So now knowing symbolic capital allows us to theorize and think about how is America viewed and is America viewed as it is because of its power or because of the symbolics or the logic of the symbolic capital. And that if we erase that, then what becomes evident as America is what Mr. Trump is representing. And if you do that, would more of the world love America, like America, or join hands with the United States if they need an international coalition, right? So that's how, I mean, this is really brief and probably simplistic use of the term symbolic capital. So I'm going to go to another theorist, John Rapley, whose work on globalization is crucial, and he also talks about how different regimes work. So let's say the symbolic capitalistic regime of United States was based in this misrecognition of reading America as a generous, as a kind, as a law-abiding power, right? But now that regime has come to crisis because that symbolics has been replaced by straight, brute facts of what United States wants, how it wants it, right? So that means that the symbolic capital of United States has reached a moment of crisis because people have now started seeing the naked truth of its power. Is that sustainable? Rapley would say that in economic regimes it is not sustainable. When, when a regime loses its hegemony and its acceptance as it is in the eyes of the people, the regime must go and renegotiate its contract with the people, right, and create a new hegemony. So if United States symbolic regime and its recognition in those symbolic terms has been brought to crisis, and not by U.S. enemies, but their president themselves, then it can only be sustained through the nakedness of power, 
coercive power of economy and military threat and all that, right? To go back to or to renegotiate the symbolics of U.S. reception in the world, right, a new regime has to be established, right? And in order to do that, the vocabularies, the language of how America presents itself and its mouthpiece being the office of the president will have to change. So in the long run, using this theory, then we already understand that while U.S. economy might be doing great, jobs are being created, wealth is being produced, it is not correlative and coextensive with the symbolic power of United States in the world. Actually, the symbolic power of United States in the world is diminishing, right? And that is an important distinction to make because then we can argue using this theory that maybe the way things are being done, the way Mr. Trump is conducting his business, Maybe it makes economic sense, maybe it is financially sound, but in terms of its symbolics, it is actually damaging United States all over the world, right? And in the, another important question is that does, can America sustain its power and reach only because of its economy? Or would it need that symbolic capital? Yes, it can do that with its economy, with nations who depend on the United States, or with the dictatorial regimes who, will, who like this dictatorial vein of United States politics, because then they don't have to answer any hard questions. The Saudi crown prince, right? The dictators in Africa and Asia, they, Mr. Moody, right? They're fine with Mr. Trump because Trump no longer asks them about moral issues or political choices that they have made because the United States, in a way, has abdicated that responsibility in return for economic gains. But globally then, that also weakens the belief in the decency, generosity, and law-abiding spirit of United States as a world power. And if that is damaged, then in a long run, United States itself will be damaged materially because it will no longer have the power to make new allies or to effect meaningful change in the world. So this is how briefly you can even use very esoteric theory to read contemporary politics and situations all around you. I hope this was useful to you. I'm just doing it by way of an example of applying theory to real life situations. Um, any other uh, things that I meant to say, I have not s really openly done that because that wasn't my purpose in this lecture. When I do criticize power, I do it openly and freely and without fear. But this lecture was meant to just display how theory can be used to understand politics and to learn more about how the world works and maybe how it ought to work. That's all for today. I hope this was useful to you. Thank you so much. I will see you next time. And if you like this, please do subscribe to this channel. I would love to have you as uh, my regular friends and guests. So until next time, thank you so much and peace and love.